Welcome, 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 guys. Please let me know if the music's too loud. Hello, welcome. I'm so excited to be here, guys. Let me know if my the music is too loud or the mic is too loud. Hey, let's go. Welcome, everyone. Artur, Zazuju, Rodrigo, Ju. Hey, Ju. What's up? Eddie, Marcia, Anthony. Hey, welcome. Yeah, I'm live, Ju. What is up, everyone? Welcome to my first stream on ZBrush Live. And today we're going to take it pretty easy, right? Chill. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Heads up, first and foremost, is that I've been having some issues with my machine lately. So if ZBrush crashes or the stream pauses a little bit, please let me know. Well, if ZBrush crashes, I'll know. <laughs> That's for sure. But I mean, it hasn't crashed so far today. So we're good to go, I think. All right, so what I thought we could do on stream was we could do small little dioramas, which uh, still takes some time to make. Uh, it's a lot of modeling, a lot of texturing as well. And as you might have noticed, if you checked out the ZBrush Live calendar, uh, my streams are gonna be every two weeks. It's not gonna be uh, every week, but I am streaming every week. I'm just streaming in between ZBrush Live and my own personal channel. The reason is that uh, a lot of the work that goes into making an environment, regardless of how small it is, it involves a lot of ZBrush, at least in my workflow, but it also involves a lot of Unreal, Substance Painter, and integration between ZBrush, Substance, and Unreal. And I'm gonna go through and do that integration and do that assembly in Unreal and, Z and Substance uh, on my own channel. On ZBrush Live, I'm gonna focus mostly, uh, I, I would say 99% of the workflows inside of ZBrush and how I go about creating small little environments like these. So, hello. Oh, a lot of people joining. That's great news. How are you guys doing? Okay, already looking great. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. All right, so this is a very old environment. The first time I actually gave it a try to do an environment inside a ZBrush, I decided that we could go and revisit this old piece and remake it from scratch. So what I, what I have here is the sword model, which is courtesy, the concept is courtesy of a friend of mine that at the time he was working at Blizzard Entertainment. And this was a personal piece that he did for his portfolio a while back. And I got permission from him to do a model based on his, on his concept. This was oh, four years ago, I think. That was a long time ago. This was pre-pandemic. So time just flew by. Um, so this was the result of my experimentation in ZBrush at the time. I was um, still figuring out a lot of the, of the features and techniques inside of ZBrush that nowadays I use on a, on a, a regular everyday basis. And uh, yeah, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to remake this environment, make a small little diorama. I have my own mood board set up and pure ref on the side here. Let me know if the music's too loud, guys. Uh, I can't really guess from my end. Okay, so to start off, let me just bring in this polycule and clear the canvas. And also let me know if you have any questions uh, regarding what I've been doing. A lot of the time I'll be a little silent, just doing some work. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rename this block out. And this is gonna be the block out of the terrain. We're gonna try to do the most of the terrain today, but a lot of the terrain is gonna be 
At least that's how I usually work. It's gonna be modular. So a lot of modular rocks and cliff meshes and all of that. And we could possibly go over some game art production techniques here as well, like making tileable textures, doing displacement map workflows. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be cool. So I don't really like this cube usually. Oh, whoops, uh, wrong hotkey there. Because it has a pole there. So I switch immediately to the poly cube from the gizmo and I start working from there. And I'm gonna change my material. And just This is a, this material uh, together with a lot of brushes that I use for stylized work is from Michael Vincente is uh, I think he's currently working at Blizzard uh, He's an environment artist there and he has the orb clay materials and the orb brushes I use them in conjunction with a lot of other brushes. We're gonna go through here I have my own custom menu here with a lot of his brushes here like the orb rocks detail or flatten edge uh, the rock noise, slash, etc. But I have more brushes that I use on a daily basis, like Z Modeler. I love Z Modeler. <laughs> okay, so let me just check a few things here before we actually start. And let's crease this just to check the proportions. All right, so if, actually, I'm going to start with a with a poly cylinder not a cube because i want to make the altar piece it's the main thing right it's going to crease so let me just block this out real quick i'm just going to duplicate this actually make a poly group Get the round piece here. And I was thinking maybe we could have the sword stuck on a stone, you know, King Arthur style. So maybe, maybe I'm gonna turn this upside down. I'm gonna make another one here. Just gonna bring in a sphere 3D. And I'm gonna split this. Uh, yeah, my menu is a little chaotic but I, I do use it a lot. So if you guys have any questions of what I'm clicking, I can go through the, you know, the regular menus if you want uh, for some of the things, if you require me to go through them. But yeah, so this is gonna be the rock here. I do work on dynamic mode, dynamic subdivision mode for some time until I figure out what I'm gonna do. So let's duplicate this again. Now we can start with a cube. And I could split this into a second subtool. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I just work on the same subtool. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna start renaming this Block Out Rocks. Or maybe Cliff. Let's call it the Cliff. I'm gonna split this up real nice and this I'm gonna call this block out rock and this is gonna be the rock and uh, ooh, this cliff here this I don't need to be in dynamic because uh it's gonna be the terrain not the terrain but just the block out yeah they are <laughs> I'm sorry I mean it, it, they are a little, I mean, I mean, to me, I know where everything is, you know, I organize them in a way that's uh, related to the my custom workflow. So, for example, I have Dynamesh, Delete Hidden, Close Holes and Sculptures Pro all together because I, I use them regularly together. Right. So so I try to, to create a custom menu that sort of makes sense. So, for example, I have the subdivision controls here when you're working in subdivisions and dynamic here. So once I apply, this is sort of like chronologically going through the workflow because I go Dynamesh. I sculpt in Dynamesh when I'm making broad statements. And then I remesh that probably at some point. And then I use either a dynamic workflow, especially if I'm 
going for a hard surface and hard surface I usually go low poly until the very end uh, and once it's there you have Z remesher here which I it's at the end because I use this sometimes just to get a quick like game ready asset um, and I don't want to bother too much with going into the nitty-gritty of the retopology workflows even though I love that and I know some of you guys that know me think I'm a freak for that <laughs> but I'm sorry but I love the the retopology techniques especially in ZBrush I mean I do most of my retopology in ZBrush I would say 95% I do them in ZBrush so okay so cool let's go over and start doing maybe some deforming let me look at the concepts and see what I'm going for Let's do some tapering here. Let's go dynamic, just in case. And one cool thing that we can do is actually use a ray mesh right off the bat, just to preview what it's gonna look like. So this could be a little thinner, something like this. And now I can go over, just to preview what it's gonna look like, I can go here and maybe offset this a little bit and mirror and rotate it around the Y in 90. Let's scale it up. Right, so now let's append the new. And let's lock position and rotate this around. Maybe that's a little too much. Just trying to figure out the flow of the, of the diorama here. And it's just easier for me to preview this using a ray mesh. It's just a very quick way to, to get the feel of the silhouette because that's very important. I should have this highlighted. And let's go. Okay. And maybe I want to... No, I don't want to rotate in the... X, maybe just a little bit. And here's the cool things. This is, is this is super low poly already. It's not, you know, a complete sort of mesh figure. Oh jeez, I shouldn't have locked position. Yes, there we go. Ah, yeah, I'm gonna make this an array, and now I can have a hotkey assigned for the array. So let's just start plucking in some rocks here. And, oh wait, let me just grab another piece for the plinth, which I'm not really sure what's gonna look like. But I am gonna make one single plinth here. Just to block it out real quick. Maybe it could be in the corner there. I don't know. Might uh, might just array this. Lock position, reset, X mirror. It's just a non-destructive way to have symmetry on without using mirror and weld. Thanks. Thank you. Well, this this isn't you know. It's just a block out. So it's still. Just figuring out the silhouette. I mean, it feels too flat here. The side, we're gonna fix that. The idea is you have like a single cliff mesh and then you sort of build the environment We're using those meshes. But yeah, and maybe he, this could be separate. All 
Oops. Ah, Jesus, it's on the same. Doesn't matter. I can split this now. There we go. And this should be like a cylinder. I don't want it to be too big. I might need to import. Let me just uh, import. Where is that thing? I'll import it later. Let me fix this. Just trying to get some reference here. I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because it's going to be uh, just a, a render, right? It's not going to be like game ready in, to, in a sense that's going to have like the player roam the environment. But if it was like scale, it's still important, especially if you're using like physical lighting in your environment. But it's not the main thing, not for this kind of endeavor. Hmm. There we go. Let's see if I have time, I can show you a few things I do with with Quixel, Quixel Mega Scans together with ZBrush. Let's see. So let me import that tool. It's in my desktop right here. Yeah, it doesn't matter. There we go. This is the human ref mesh that I bring in from Maya usually. Now, where is it? Oh Jesus, that's small. <laughs> See what I mean? So yeah. So let me put this in the center. And what I usually do if I want to rescale everything is I turn on what Paul used to call the pizza box, right? So you turn on the pizza box and now you can scale everything, every subtool. Whoops. Whoa, it's gone. Uh, let me bring this in again. Pizza box mode. And let's scale this baby up. Actually, let me put this to the side. And now, especially if I over over the sword because I want the sword to sort of be the middle of the scaling and I'll scale it up but I won't scale it too much because otherwise the brushes are not you know because ZBrush has its own um, scaling system so I don't want to scale that too much I'll just have to keep in mind that I'll sort of have to well sort of double or maybe do the scaling inside Unreal, I don't know. So, it doesn't really matter. It's just for me to get a very basic reference there. Okay, so this, let's go increase this. And this is gonna be, one of the cool things about this workflow is that if you have the cylinder and you feel like you need, let's say, a shape, specific shape. You don't need to use the initialize button. It's basically your own initialize, like the gizmo. So that's why I prefer this workflow, because it's just way faster. Now if I crease PG, there we go. You got this little shape there. Now let's just build a rock, and I'm gonna maybe duplicate this and I'm gonna use this together with the other block out to start doing some ZBrush voodoo here. So this is non subdivided. We can hide the, the rock for now, the pseudo rock. All right. Let me just divide a couple more times and delete lower. And I'm gonna dynamesh this. 
Mm, Jesus. Now I'm scared every time it, it sort of freezes a little bit. Mm, I want to retain. Maybe I want to go lower. I just sculpt something here. There we go. And that's even, that's a little high though. I mean, you want to go as low as possible, especially in the beginning. You're working from overall to the specifics, right? Not the other way around. A black and white window. You mean this one? This little window here? A Barrera is still there? You're referring to this thing here, right? Well, I don't usually, if you're referring to this, I don't usually turn it off because it's pretty useful for me, especially in the early stage. I want to check the silhouette and how that's working before I, I commit to anything specific. But you can scale it down to like a very minimum size and, and don't, there's, there's definitely a way to, to turn it off. I just don't know it, to be honest, because I use it. <laughs> I use it all the time. That's why I never turn it off. So sometimes I want to check, like, I don't know, from without, with and without perspective. That's also important. So turn on and off, like, perspective to check if the silhouette changes a lot or not. And you can see it changes a little bit, especially on the bottom. And you want to make sure the changes are minimal in terms of, like, the composition, right? And we're, start, we're still figuring out the composition, so... I don't know, I mean, I'm sorry I'm not more useful in that regard. Yes, you can. I'm just not sure where. But I know there's thumbnail, probably this. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, you just go to preferences thumbnail. Thank you, Marcia. <laughs> that is it. I just never turn it off. I, I just go and use it all the time. So, Right, so let's start using the clipping brushes clip curve I use polygroups on most of the time and I wanna oops I wanna start clipping this so the cool thing about polygroup on is that you retain you get polygroups every time you do a slice so we could do we can ignore this platform here I'm just gonna do some random cuts here and there just to have this be a little more, oh, whoops. Uh, my tablet is on the fritz as well, Jesus. And you get polygroups there, so that, that's useful, because then you can polish on, uh, on, on the deformation. I'm just gonna, Make sure this is all tapering downwards. And we're gonna sculpt it anyway, but I wanna have polygroups. That's the key. The cool thing about polygroups is that if you understand how polygroups work, you understand ZBrush, basically. You understand every feature in ZBrush, because to a certain point, Almost all features in ZBrush use polygroups or can use polygroups. So if you use polygroups, then you're on your way to be a ZBrush master, you know, which I am not because I still don't understand a lot of the features, especially with, uh, with the new releases. Like every time Pixelogic releases a new version, my head just blows away because she's so many cool things they add that it's just mind-boggling so let me just maybe do a little cut here and one of the things that I usually start by thinking again I'm thinking of the shape I'm looking there okay every time I'm, I'm just rotating around checking if the silhouette has changed in any particular manner and you can also use the move brush and I use the move brush on the uh, I use the move infinite depth, whoops, BMN, right? And then I turn dynamic off so I can move it based on the, the canvas and the size related to the canvas and not the size of the 
mesh because this is a huge mesh, right? A question about polishing, if anyone can help. I'm making uh, I poly model a knife in mid poly and I have a problem and replace behind. Well, you can you can have a poly group there. That's what I was saying, right? So if you have a knife like this one, let's say, and imagine this is a very low poly knife. Uh, it's not a knife, but you know, you get the point. You're you're saying that what, this tip is too thin, and once you polish, you basically it rounds out, right? It, it becomes a little round roundish, right? So what you do is you have a poly group on this side and a poly group on that side. That's why it's so useful to work low poly as long as possible. Because if you have poly groups now and you polish by groups, it's going to try to retain that border between the poly groups, right? So let me just give you a quick example. So if you go to, let me just create a, let's just use a, I don't know, like a sphere. So let's say, let me change the material, something a little more akin to this. So let's say you have, this is a, oh, I right, make poly mesh 3D. Okay. So let's say you have like this little thing. Let me sculpt something. I don't know, like just carve it in here. And then maybe use the trim dynamic. So you have this sort of very harsh division there, right? And now what I want to do is I want to mask this off. If you're working low poly, it's easier because you you can actually go with Z modeler and, and and paint poly groups. But let's say you have this right, and you want to retain that crispness, which is not too crisp because it's low poly. But still, you can go over here to deformation, and under deformation, there's a polish by groups slider, right? And the polish by groups, uh, whoops, not this one. Polish by groups will polish everything except that border. It's, it's going to retain that little border there, right? So even if you're working in a very, let's say, low poly workflow. So let's say another example, like uh, Sphere 3D. Let's just do this in a more of a low poly-ish fashion. Something like this. And let's say you're, you want to, eventually you want to smooth this out. Let's say this is my dynamic subdivision, but you want this edge there to stay crisp. What you go is to BZM, that's Z modeler. Whoops. BZM. This, and now you hover over one of the faces. Doesn't matter which uh, action you have turned on. You hover over one of the faces and you press and hold Alt, and then you just paint the polygroups with, with still with the alt key hold on and then you let go of alt and there's a polygroup there and you can also without letting go of the tablet you keep tapping alt to change the polygroup right so, and then you can keep painting go of alt and maybe you want this these ones here as well and now even in dynamic mode you can come over to i'm gonna go through the menu so you guys see what i'm doing uh, on your end you go to the, to the cre crease and you do crease PG, which is going to create a crease around the polygroups. Of course, this has a pole, which is why I hate poles. Uh, but you get my point, right? And this is exactly what's going to happen when you polish by groups. It's going to basically smooth everything, but retain that border between the two polygroups. It's going to try. It's not the same thing as a crease. It's not doing a crease, but because a crease won't change that shape, but it is gonna change that shape. So if you just divide this, let me just uncrease all. And let's just divide this. Let's apply our dynamic. And now, oh wow, what is that? Is this, let me just check if there's something there that's, nope, something's definitely wrong here. I can go. Control Shift X, Control Shift S, there we go. Yeah, there's an extra loop there, which I had no intention of. I can f try to fix that. Mm, doesn't matter. Right, for this exa example, doesn't really matter. So I have divided this, I can keep dividing. 
actually let's apply the dynamic and keep dividing that's a lot of millions of polygons I'm sorry <laughs> that's too much yeah just like a million or something it still has that poly group there right so if you go over to let's delete lower in case like you're okay you have your high poly right and you want to retain that little edge or for some reason let's go to our low poly ish and let's Q mesh the whole poly group island all right and let's say you want to retain that poly group there not this one but that one there so you want to borrow this so alt tap and hold and then let go of alt it's going to change the poly group but if you click and hold shift it's going to borrow that poly group to the rest that you paint so if you let go now and now you just paint your poly group and hold whoops hold shift it's a little bit of a muscle memory exercise but you'll get used to it so you paint this there's a border there right you want to keep that crisp edge let's say right so we're going to crease this just so we retain that edge i'm going to apply now uncrease and now let's divide one more time all right you want to retain that right so if you polish this now if you polish by groups it's going to polish everything but still retain that edge so let's say you sculpt something over here or maybe let's smooth this out and maybe do a trim dynamic i don't know do stuff like this right so there's some unevenness in the surface and here as well we can do like alt key with the trim dynamic just do some welding effect or something i don't know just go over here do this all right so if you polish by groups let's just smooth this out as well this edge and you'll see what i mean it's getting softer that's what's happening when you're uh, when you're polishing right but if you now polish by groups it's gonna polish everything ideally it is polishing it's just too high poly so let's do this with the open circle there we go you see it's polishing everything but it's trying to retain that edge it's still very crisp so go over here again and you see it's polishing everything except that border between the two poly groups so that's that's exactly how you would solve that issue so if you have a knife or something you want to have a very crisp edge which is something i wouldn't advise not at least to this point because there's no such thing as an edge that's that's super crisp like this that screams cgi in your face you just smooth it out a little bit after the fact to get that little uh, transition there that catches the eye light right yeah yeah you're welcome all right let's go back to the the thingy here and let's go back to our clip curve and one of the cool things i try to think when i'm doing this is let's go back to our move infinite depth and one of the things i do in move infinite depth on this stage jesus uh is go over to brush and there's a thing here, not in create, is on curve, and turn on accu curve. And what this does is that if you move, it's gonna move to a point. This is what I usually use to to change the. You see that? It's like moving to a point there. And I can move this, make this a little more interesting. just from a silhouette perspective. And I can still come over here and clip this. So let's try to do something that's more like crystalline. All right. Mm -mm -mm. change the boxy nature of this 
keep in mind that move infinite depth is moving through the mesh like so so there's no there's no way to that the other side is not going to keep up and uh, let's try trim adaptive now whoops yeah, i'm just going to trim this just to create some breakup here and there This is not needed. Just to break up those edges a little bit. Let me go to solo mode. I'm, I'm tapping outside the document to rotate, but I don't usually do that. It's just that my, my pen is a little broken <laughs> from all the usage. So the button that I assign to right click, which is this one, is how I usually rotate around the model like this, you see, but sometimes it doesn't work. So that's why sometimes I, when it doesn't work, my it's just I've gotten into the habit of just going like this, you know, it's like using both methods. But I am with the right click army, if you know what I mean. Let's just try to break this up a little bit. One cool brush that I love to use for rocks, and it's it's under actually it's on the light box. If you go over to brush. There's a mallet brush, the mallet brushes. Where's the mallet? Oh, Jesus, I'm a little blind. Yeah, there's the mallet fast and the mallet fast two. And I use them in conjunction. So if I go to BJ, BMJ, which is like mallet fast and BM2 is mallet fast two. Um, depends on, on your setup, of course. So the mallet fast two, if you click on a plane, let's say like this, and you press up, it's gonna retain that normal and just slash there. Of course, this is still not enough. So what I usually do is I tap a lot of times and sometimes I do alt as well. There's dynamics turned off, so that's perfect. And I try to break this up even further. And This is gonna be cleaned up as we go. Whoops. And you can see what it's doing. It's basically picking an, a, a normal and chopping it up. And you can do a little cut like this. That. Hmm. This is still, and array mesh is still there, so I can still press array, and it will give me sort of a preview of the rocky formation. Hello. Sorry if I butchered that. Still fairly low poly. Whoops. Dynamesh this whole thing again. It, it's still pretty blurry and I want to keep it that way because I want to Be able to preview what it's gonna look like. So this is too flat right now. I can tell that area there It's too flat for my purposes here
<laughs> raccoon. <laughs> but it's a raton, right? A raton laveur. It's a little hard, yeah. I mean, you have to forgive me, man. I had three years of French classes in school, and I forgot most of it. <laughs> uh... this just break it up break up the surface a little bit there All right I don't really want to I want I don't want a diagonal um, sort of going this way I think it's because I already have that I've done that before so there's it's just that I don't want to repeat the same thing. I don't want to do something that's very... Um... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I try, man. I try. Try is the correct word. Oh, this is rotate, sorry. So something like this. But we might want to change Change the scale up a little bit, and maybe change the curve here. Maybe it's rotated on the y axis, which is something. Let's mirror this. Hmm. here and let's push it to the front ever so slightly something like that I mean this is still it's just a ray mesh right so it's not Maybe that's too many repetitions. Maybe two of them works. I want to push this. Push this up to the side. Yeah. Trying to check the silhouette. How oh, does that change? Because I want to have sort of like this view. So this would be my my main view. And I'm gonna go to draw, and I'm gonna store a camera. Ah, oh, Jesus, I have. I must have perspective on. Okay, cool. Store camera. Let's call it main. And I wanna assign a hotkey to this. Yeah. So I want to assign a hotkey to this, so control alt tap and oof, I don't know, control one maybe, yeah there we go, control one, it's my main camera, I'll punch, to become a 3D environment artist, so I would love to hear what should be my approach in Zebra Strider, right? you can come so. Uh, so yeah, so as an environment artist, at least in my workflow, like ZBrush is absolutely pivotal. Like I, I don't do anything that I, I would say, unless you're doing like effects and that's it. And even in effects, I, I use ZBrush sometimes for some things, but I would say if you're doing like a more technical role, but if it's purely 3D environment artists, like ZBrush is is 
is going to be key. And here's the thing. I don't know what you mean by iterate different concepts, but for iteration, definitely ZBrush. And it doesn't matter if you're an environment artist or a character artist. Like ZBrush just allows for such a fluid workflow that you don't, you don't really use, like you don't really, well, there's other sculpting applications, of course, but I would say ZBrush is king in that regard. Because there's so many features here that allow you for fast iteration, uh, and you can even generate. A f if you're doing, if you're working in games, I don't know what, what industry you mean, but if it's in games, you can fairly easy, uh, yeah, for concepting, definitely quicker, more efficient, yeah. Uh, if you're doing it in games and you want to show like how something. Uh, looks in the game engine there's multiple ways that zbrush allows you to just remesh or decimate and have uvs and uh and then just bring in that mesh into unreal or unity or whatever game engine you're working on um if you're in a company you usually have like uh you know um proprietary engines that you're working on but it's the same thing yeah video game industry uh, I would say video game VFX and ZBrush has been in the, it's in multiple industries not just video games and VFX and and animation there's like uh, collectibles there's jewelry design there's medical simulation there's the automotive industry as well but for games I mean yes it's a must so you must uh, learn ZBrush <laughs> basically I would say my honest and humble opinion that you you definitely have to to learn ZBrush. Is there an inside fear of the AI industry? An inside fear. What do you mean by inside fear? A fear that's inside of me, or a fear inside the industry? Well, I would have to tell you that that goes. That depends on the individual. It's a very individual, um, a very individual stance right i'm not afraid of ai at all because i don't think it's gonna ruin anything i think it's gonna add to it as long as there's le legislation for it but that's a whole different topic that we can go into the problem i would see is that it, there's no legislation at the moment for uh to for copyright like copyright uh, uh, legislation right I, I'm not sure. That depends. It depends on the individual, to be honest. There are people that are uh, very much pro uh, AI, which is something I'm not as well. I'm not pro or against AI. It's just a tool, right? For me, it's just a tool. Uh, but uh, definitely there are people that are against AI at all costs. And I believe that we will come to terms in the middle. At, at some point eventually people will come will 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 come together in the middle you know yes you can get the student version yes it's nine dollars per semester so 9.99 i think i'm not really sure uh let me see if i can put him up here sec uh, this is a forum so the teachers educational licensing yeah there it is so if you're a student or a teacher you get max on one you get max on one for uh, $9.99 US dollars uh, every six months. So at the end of the year, you pay like $20. And if you're in the US, that's like nothing, right? And you get student license uh, for ZBrush. So cool, let's carry on. Uh, Check my concept again. We need 
to start breaking this up a little bit. Start creating some some cuts here and there. Dynamesh. Just creating some formations there that don't necessarily change the silhouette, but we can get them to change the silhouette. Go MJ, mallet fast. This is too, it's just a peak there, that makes no sense. This mallet fast works like um, like clay buildup for me on rocks, but it is a little different because it really picks picks up the the normal there. This can get can go through like this. Start breaking up the surface here and there. Eventually, this has too much noise for stylized rock, and we're gonna clean this up uh, later. Uh, BM2. It's just a matter of clipping some rocks here and there and then reforming them. I want to take a look at Yeah, something like that. Let's go to the first stage and move it down a little bit. There we go. 
see if there's something here. Eventually this is going to be the workflow in Unreal, not, not in the... What is the most important thing you think about when you're building worlds? Well, first of all is why that world exists, right? So the first and foremost thing you have to think about is why are you making, let's say you're making a tavern or something. Why does that tavern exist? And you're like, oh, it's for people to drink, right? Yes, but why is it where it is? And where is it? Where is that tavern? Is it in, a, let's say, a dwarf city? And what is it doing in a dwarf city? Is it in a, I don't know, in a small village by the fields? Or all of that will, will eventually influence what you put into that environment and how you convey that through visual storytelling. So that's that's a whole different ball game, right? But again, you have to start thinking about that on the on your on your mood board, on your style guide, on everything that you do in pre-production when you're thinking about the environment. Yeah. Did you start in environments or did you start in something else? Well, uh, to be honest, I started in everything because I was self-taught for nine years, I guess, around nine years, eight years. I was self-taught and I was working primarily in Maya at the time. I was using Maya for most everything. And at the time it was, uh, I d dabbled a little bit into Unity uh, in game engines. And hey, Ian, what's up? So I was dabbling in game engines at the time, and, but just as a, a self-taught, you know, student and all that. But uh, when I started to do a little bit more of ZBrush, I was, I was, the first time I saw ZBrush was way back when, when I was learning Maya. Hey, thank you, man. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, be sure to check out Hian. He's in the chat. <laughs> hey, Anna. How you doing? So I was, as I was saying, I was uh, doing uh, a lot of like training online, like tutorials and stuff like that. And I did, ran into the Eat 3D tutorials by Michael Pavlovich at the time. This was way back when you would buy DVDs online and have them send it to you or download them, which would take a long time, <laughs> and then just watch it, right? So I watched that, but I was so scared and intimidated by ZBrush because the interface was so different than what I was used to at the time. So I never really got into ZBrush up until like three month, three years ago. So that's when I, I started because I was doing drawing, like life drawing at a, an atelier in Porto called, uh, well, the Americans call it Porto Atelier, but it's a little, it's a longer name. <laughs> uh, it's a longer name and it's Portuguese, so it's hard to pronounce. So let's just call it Porto Atelier, right? And I was doing life drawings uh, from life, basically. And eventually the natural progression from that to the digital realm is, is character art, right? That Because you're doing drawing, you're drawing from life. Uh, the natural progression, of course, would be characters. So that's what I started doing in ZBrush, like doing sketches. During the pandemic, I still remember in the first few months, we were all locked out of, of our in our apartments and and my master from the Porto Atelier, like, is a friend of mine, is Daniel Gamelas. He had, he was a student at New York Academy of Arts, so he had live sessions on Zoom with a live model, and he could invite everyone. So everyone would join, and I would join, instead of drawing, I would do ZBrush sketches while looking at the live model through Zoom, which is horrible, by the way, because <laughs> the... Because the resolution's horrible, sometimes the lighting was horrible, and the stream blurred it out because, you know, there's all that, those problems, you know. Yeah, posso fazer em português, se quiseres, fazer um stream em português. Mas, metade da audiência não vai perceber. Yeah, yeah, that was Portuguese, sorry guys. <laughs> so, um, 
so yeah, I was I was doing characters then because I was just getting comfortable with ZBrush. That's when I made a little bar here with brushes that I needed. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, you can't. Um, that right there. This is this is all I did for life uh, drawing, life, life sculpting actually sessions, and I still keep it there as a reminder that sometimes the simpler is better. Just use a couple of brushes and go to town. And, uh, and yeah, so I was doing characters, but I started studying with Paul during the pandemic at Nomon. And, uh, and that's when I realized that ZBrush can go way deeper than most people think it can. Like there's a lot of features there that, that, um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I delved into, I decided environment art because I'm a multifaceted artist. I love a lot of software. I don't just work in ZBrush, but I would say ZBrush is at the core of the workflow. But I do speed tree, I do substance designer, substance painter, Maya, Quixel mixer, Unreal, of course. Uh, I do even Embergen and Gaia and terrain generation and stuff like that. So, so I do a lot of those things and, and environment art allows you to sort of, uh, go a little it, it's a little more in depth into the game development so if you're an environment artist in games you sort of need to understand a little bit more of how the engine works and how the optimization works that's super important but it's not like character artists don't do optimization but it's just different environment art it's where the game is will happen right so there's a lot of optimization goes into so that's why i decided environment art because i'm a little more technical um so yeah you can advise you can start it when you started as an environment artist what would you tell yourself to start studying shape language architecture well as an it doesn't matter if you're an environment artist or a character artist do drawing just draw you know that's not for everyone and i understand not a lot of people like to draw but you have to trust me i was horrible at drawing i never drew my entire childhood i hated drawing since i was a kid and I got the correct training, like the traditional training, perspective, anatomy, composition, value, shape language, all of that stuff and painting and color theory and, and you know, chroma, hue, saturation, whatever you want to call it. Learn how to handle temperatures and compose images. And that's universal. Doesn't matter if you're drawing from a live model or if you're drawing a building it's universal you're you're attuning your taste and your sensibility to aesthetics and composition so if you want to learn that shape language architecture design landscapes whatever start by going to classical traditional drawing classes and if you want to take classes if you just want to learn on your own and you still want to learn those things it's going to take you a lot longer because it, it's faster when you have someone that has already been through that process to teach you and push you through that process at a faster pace in a more concise way. But if, you're, if you want to learn it on your own, I would advise you to join like live modeling, live drawing sessions. I don't know where you're from, but if it's not available, there's a lot online as well. So drawing is essential, you know, like even even as an environment artist, I would say. I don't draw as much nowadays, but but I do keep that in mind that what I'm doing technically is thinking of drawing anyway. I'm still thinking of shape language anyway. So, Jesus, oops. Let me just uh, do a little bit of, of cleanup here and there. This is starting to look kind of nasty. Okay, so I'm not sure if we're going to go and do anything else today, guys, because it's already halfway through the stream and I'm, I'm still in the block out of this main cliff shape. Mm. This section here, it's, it's a little flat. Whoops. 
it less so. Just uh, Trying to make the, a little bit of a pattern here and there, but this isn't necessary anyway because I'm gonna clean it up at the end. And we can go over some cool features and techniques to project details here if you need them. Like uh, use displacement maps and then. Oh man, my process is not that <laughs> that complex, man. Uh, to be honest, it's just uh, using a ray mesh to to preview sort of like the silhouette, how I want it in Unreal eventually, and then just sculpt a rock, <laughs> and 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 that's it. <laughs> so it's not it's nothing special. It's just just a starter guide. Uh, and I was, it was wishful thinking to think I could finish <laughs> something in one go, on one two hour stream. That's another thing, like if you're doing environment art, you have to be freaking patient, man, because there's a lot of things in the process that just take forever. Like from, I'm not even talking about like baking and stuff like that, I'm talking about like the the actual iteration process. Ah, okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be there uh, on YouTube for any of you guys who, who who don't know or might not be aware. This is stored on Twitch for a short period of time, but on YouTube it's still there. You can just go to the previous live streams and and it's there. You know, so you can rewatch it at any time, or if you missed some portion of the stream. Let's go back and, and re-watch that. And just do this little spiral-ish shape. Okay, trying to get this like swirly formation on it. You can see I'm still in a fairly low poly stage, 70,000, that's nothing for ZBrush. But I will remain like that until I'm happy with the result. Which, which for some of you that know me, might take a while. Because <laughs> I am very rarely happy with, uh, <laughs> with what I do. I guess that's very common with artists, I don't know. I'm told. <laughs> that that's a very common thing. This is looking awful. This thing here. Let me clean this up. Let's go mallet fast. Let's just sculpt the flow of the terrain. Because what we can do, if this is too big, like for... Um, for Unreal, and when I mean too big, I mean it's if, if it, this is going to be baked and it's not going to use, you know, like tileable textures and all that, which we could with Nanite and Unreal, 
But if we're gonna use this for production, like to repeat it along the landscape or something, which is something you don't use Nanite for because of performance, um, you, I would need to break this up into separate chunks, let's say, at the end and make this whole thing like modular. So that's one of the things I usually do. I break this up into multi, like multiple modular pieces and then assemble everything inside the engine, inside Unreal. So, let's see. Let's just cover this up a little bit. I'm not really enjoying this section here. I might as well just cut this whole thing. There we go. And now we can go a little crazier here. And I'll just do a little bit of, of tapping. Just to check if the design is working from a, a very, let's do the orb clay. Yeah, this needs to clean up. Like the orb clay is a nice material because it allows you to to check just the details. It doesn't emphasize the shadows at all. It does when you render though. Have to go over here. Yeah. See you later, man. Thank you. Thank you for stopping by. You can watch the rest of the of the stream. Uh, it's recorded on YouTube, so. How does one reach out to the industry and you got no contacts and yours, just a little nobody? Well, that's the million dollar question, right? I would say use LinkedIn. Use LinkedIn and and be sure to keep, your, I know it, this might be hard and it's hard for me, trust me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm there, you know, so it's hard for me as well. <laughs> but to be active on social media, that's very important. Uh, and people that know me know that it's, it, it, I don't usually follow that rule <laughs> because it's very, very hard uh, to keep track of like your socials all the time. That's why uh, some people have like a team for that, like a social team, like a social media team. But I would say that's key and reach out to, to people on LinkedIn. It's very rare that I see people on LinkedIn not help out, like help each other out. Like if you have some question or something, just reach out to a recruiter or reach out to the, um, to someone at, at a studio, at a particular studio. I mean, be polite and respectful of, of their time, of course, because they're super busy, but you can definitely reach out and people will typically respond. So otherwise it's just a matter of building your own, let's say, uh, online presence, which is, odd because I'm, I'm giving that advice and I don't usually follow that advice uh, but I mean do what I do not uh, do what I say not what I do right I mean I'm not saying you should do it but it's it's usually a good idea to keep track of LinkedIn and keep track of job postings and even if you applied for a job in a couple of months apply again because they change the like the industry is always changing so you never know right so reapply for jobs i've done that multiple times so let me see this flow is not working here and let's see I want to turn this eventually when I start sculpting the details, I might need to go back to the dynamic mode with the, with the brush because it's not gonna, well, I could, but I mean, I want to retain the details. I, I use dynamic mode when I'm doing detailed sections or if I'm modeling like a prop because it retains the, sh the, the, the size, the scale in relation to the model, right? and not in relation to your uh, your document, basically. So right now, that's not the stage I'm at. I'm just trying to get this sort of spiralish effect, but keep it in a rocky sort of feel, like a very harsh, faceted 
look to it. Let's see. Oh, I'm gonna maybe check this out. Because once you start getting those facets, and then even with a ray mesh, it it, pre it previews a lot better, like of what, it, what it actually looks like, you know? And again, this is not gonna be done in a ray mesh. A ray mesh is just something I use all the time to preview what it's gonna look like. Let me just... Uh, Chop this up a little bit. Actually, actually no. Let's just do this to see if. Usually super run play for something and not, not being good enough before I'm going to get super run. And I end up not being good enough, people are going to get super angry at me. What do you mean angry? Nobody gets angry at you. <laughs> they don't go like, what, look at your portfolio and just throw their desk. <laughs> you know, that's not how, how it goes, man. Like People are understanding. And I understand that sometimes you apply for jobs and you lack feedback because they don't give you feedback most of the times and that's harsh and i understand but you have to understand like the industry is just people are extremely busy and it's very hard to provide feedback for everyone so i would reach out to individuals um and that's that's usually the best way to get feedback because like Especially during a recruitment process, there's like thousands, well, hundreds or maybe thousands of applicants for a role, right? And that's uh, very hard to get feedback on, but nobody will get angry at you. I mean, it, that's the key. Like you don't, you can't fear rejection, but you can't, I understand it's hard and I've been there and, and it's, it is incredibly hard. But one of the key things to, to, for you to learn, actually, is to not be afraid to look like a fool. There's an amazing book, and I, I don't usually recommend books <laughs> on this uh, sort of thing. It's not a technical book at all, but it is called The Mastery by George Leonard. I was, at the time, recommended. I watched uh, Paul... Um, not Paul... Uh, uh, the Watts from what was his what was his name? Jesus. Ah, uh, Jesus! I forget his first name. From the Watts Atelier, right? Uh, Jesus. I'm completely I'm getting a blank, man. What was his name, man? The first name. Let me see. Atelier overview. He has a, an atelier called the Watts Atelier. It's called Watts, but I can't remember his first name. For some reason, I always recommend people to check out his videos. And now, for some reason, I can't remember his name. Uh, let me just see. Yeah, I type in Watts painting and it gives me WhatsApp. Jesus. This is how... Google structure, so. Mm. Jeffrey Watts, that's it. Yes, that's it. Jeffrey Watts. Yeah, the name of the book, it's a book that, it's not a technical book at all. It's a very, very much a, a more of a spiritual book in a sense. And it, I know this sounds like one of those new age psychology things and all that. It's not. It's a martial arts book, actually. The guy is an Aikido master. And uh, I have the book here. I can show you. doesn't 
fall. Yeah, it's this little book here. And I don't know if you can see it. Let me. This little book here. It's a very thin book. And you can see mine is a little ruined. That's because I, I read it a lot of times. It's very easy to read as well. And I'm going to try to plug in uh, George Leonard. plug in the name uh, so it's mastery Leonard you spell Leonard yeah there it is so it's called mastery it's by George Leonard it's this one there's two of them there's one that's not by George Leonard there's and it's also good but I, don't, I wouldn't say it's as good as this one. The guy's an Aikido master and he talks about the keys to mastery. And one of the keys to mastery is not to, to be afraid to look like a fool. So I can tell you, and I don't know if Paul is here or not, but if he is, he can testify to this. When I joined Paul's class on ZBrush, I was scared and I was scared because I was very much a noob at ZBrush and this was no one right so and it, it's a it's an end of course let's say class so it's an advanced class and I was so scared that I wasn't um, ready skill wise for a class that was that advanced right and especially being at no one it was the first class I ever took uh, on anything regarding ZBrush or whatever. So one of the things I did was I reread this book and I kept reminding myself that it's okay to look like a fool. Because at the end of the day, if people are mad that you're asking questions, that's their business, that's not your business, right? You, your job as a student, that's, that's your job description, let's say, is to keep asking questions. It doesn't matter if you get the right answers or you get the wrong answers or you don't get answers your job and your responsibility as a student uh, is to ask the questions doesn't matter if you're afraid of looking like oh that's a silly question you know that's some a voice that's in your head that's go that goes like oh that's so basic i shouldn't ask that question that's exactly the moment that you should ask, ask a question. If you feel that, like, oh, no, I won't ask that question because I'm interrupting or whatever. That's exactly the, the hint that you're getting that you should ask that question. Of course, don't interrupt people. Like, don't interrupt the teacher or whatever. But be sure to ask that question. Don't leave the questions unasked, right? Especially if they're basic. Because the fact that there's a basic question that you need answer, answered it's all the, the more reason for you to ask, actually get that question answered because it's basic and you need to know that, right? So sometimes we're afraid to ask the basic questions. And I understand that. Honestly, I've been there. I think everyone's there at a certain point. Uh, and but again, if they're basic and you're afraid to ask them because they're a very basic question, all the more reason for you to ask him. Uh, for ask the question right so that's one of the things he talks about in the book it's uh it's called uh, it's called not being afraid to look like a fool look like a clown right and that's actually the role of comedians in society right is to ask the difficult questions uh, without the, the fear of show, social judgment that's why there were court gestures so they could ridicule the king without being slaughtered I'd say well some kings still slaughter them but <laughs> you know what I mean and nobody's gonna slaughter you for asking questions okay so if you want to ask questions regarding the industry or skill wise or portfolio wise just ask it away and I mean we have a limited time on ZBrush live but I can answer any question you, you push at me but if you want to do uh, some more like in-depth reviews and portfolio reviews you can follow my own channel on twitch i don't know if you're on twitch or youtube even on youtube you can follow me on youtube i'm doing streams uh 
well, I'm do streaming next week by this time and you can you can plug me in there and I, we can go through uh, some more stuff related to that so that's okay yeah so I'm doing this on ZBrush live like focusing on the ZBrush section possibly I'll still focus on the ZBrush section on my own stream for some reason because I haven't I haven't uh, gotten to where I wanted with this sculpt uh, but the idea on my own stream is to go over the rest of the of the pipeline and workflows and that's clearly not happening today um, let me just go into yes Just get a chunk of that chopped off. Uh, no, Mallet Fast 2 is in the light box under the brush palette. Oh, Jesus, sorry. That was a mistake. <laughs> that is an overlay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that is supposed to be my channel's overlay. So, yeah. But yeah, the Mallet Fast 2 brush is right over here on the brush palette, uh, the brush menu on the light box. Mallet, and there's Mallet Fast 2, Mallet Fast. That's usually the two ones I use. Um, Yeah, I mean, I don't know if someone's screaming at you when they review your portfolio, man, but if they are, man, just to, I don't want to say anything that compromises, but I wouldn't take that person's advice to heart, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, there's no way people, I mean, I was a teacher for a few years there and I mean, I know there are teachers that are more harsh than others. I never found that to be to be useful in any sort, uh, in any regard. <laughs> you know, like people don't learn when they're screamed at all the time. You know, or they don't learn when they're when they're being forced to do something at all. And I know that's hard in the, in the the usual like uh, school environment, but it is it is possible to to have constructive criticism in a classroom as a teacher you know what i mean sounds so odd to say that like oh a teacher should be doing constructive advice and not bashing at the student wow <laughs> revolutionary i know don't quote me on that one i'm gonna patent that before anyone steals that idea a teacher giving constructive advice so if someone's you know bashing you and making you feel horrible uh, because you're not there yet uh, just just run away from that person you know like that's not usually a good thing for anyone all right so let's just say this is as a block out this works or like a, a huge rock formation thingy I'm not saying I like it okay <laughs> but let's say this works just for the purposes of okay we have some sort of like rocky shape again we're gonna do uh, the other uh, shape that's a smaller one that's gonna clip through the big one and now we want to think about what we're gonna do here and what we could possibly do is we could shape this up a little bit actually this could be a little bit up here and we can make this go actually we can make this whoops nope well actually yes 
Mm. Yeah, this is kind of working. I'm gonna have some stairs here, so let's just block out. Oops, block out some stairs here. So, and one cool thing that I'm gonna show you guys is a way to get really cool stairs. Well, they're realistic, but we can change that anyway, and we could do our very own like tileable textures anyway. And we're gonna do that. Let me split this. Split unmasked. And the naming must be horrible. Let me check. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's horrible. I like to keep the naming conventions, especially if I, if I was doing art surface. <laughs> Jesus, man, that gets really confusing really fast. So usually it's a good idea to keep the... So I'm going to shape this to the overall well shape of the stairs and I prepared a little height map to deform this so let's say these are the steps something like this right let me hide this for now Yeah, we want to have some stairs like that. And now I want to do some polygroups here, BZM for, yes, this requires dynamic to be turned on. And this is going to be, actually, I don't need this right now to keep it more. Yeah, something like that. Now in a polygroup, flat island. I'm going to do some UVs, guys. And I'm going to do some quick UVs. And there's a new thing here that's UV. You can actually create UVs using the creases now, which is super cool. So crease edges, and now I'm going to crease PG. Back you know, in the day, <laughs> I used to have to use a UV master and a Z plugin to uh, basically generate some UVs, but now that's not necessary. I'll just crease the, <coughs> the poly groups and now let's morph it. Let's check, actually wait, you need to dial this down to zero. And I want this to be straight. Well, as straight as I can, right? So let me do the grid. Where is the grid? Right. This is irrelevant. I mean, we're we're just gonna project some displacement maps here. There we go. Uh, yeah, this doesn't need a ray mesh, nor does that one, to be fair. Let me just put my pivot back in place. And now I want to go over here to displacement. Actually, let me divide this. I want to uncrease this here. Increase this. Oh, this wasn't creased. My bad. And let me divide this, yeah, something like that. You're gonna see, right? This looks like a roguelike game trophy place to get a power weapon. Exactly, That's that was the point. <laughs> so it's like you go in and you take out the sword, you know, from the stone, you know. You can't get any more cliche than that. <laughs> take the stone off the rock. So let me see if we can go through this workflow real quick before 
we call it a day. Let me see. So I'm going to import an alpha that I had uh, here. 16 bit bit. There we go. And I want to morph this and check if, if I need to. Mm, okay, there is a problem. Let me go to delete. Let me use the UV master. Poly groups. Yeah, I need to be on the lowest or work on clone. Let me work on clone. Z plugin, flatten, and I want this to be pointing up. And I guess we're back to the old workflow. Something like that. And this could go down because it's a different pattern there. And this is irrelevant. And now we unflatten this, copy UVs, go back to our block out thing and Z plugin and paste UVs. And there we go. And now if we morph these UVs, they should be flatter. Exactly. There we go. So now I want to project this and it changed me to this skin shade weird material which I don't appreciate because I don't like that skin shade. Well, the skin shade is useful, especially if you're previewing like textures and all that. I ask a question, what's the plan to deal with the intersection parts of the bricks and the stone? What do you mean the intersection parts of the bricks and the stone? You mean the, you mean on the overall, like this intersection? This is just a preview. This is, this is a ray mesh. So in the level, what you usually do is you, you create either a shader effect that uses dithering to, to blend uh, the, the meshes together, or, or you create more stuff <laughs> to hide those seams. It depends on how heavy you want your shaders to be, but there is a way. Uh, so again if this is like for games pipeline you usually end up doing most of the things in the engine as well so there's multiple ways to do that hello brazil i'm from portugal but we speak the same language so hello <laughs> okay so let's just turn displacement on actually we need a texture map new texture and displacement let's put this intensity up Something like that. Mm, you can see the UVs are still pretty big. Don't crash, please. Okay. Yeah, this is too small, so minus point 0.1. I mean the UV shells in, in relation to the... Let me just put this maybe smaller, a little bit smaller. Yeah, before we apply this store morph target, just in case, you know, but let me go back to the clone here. Where's the clone? There it is. And I'm gonna flatten this up. Yeah, this is too. So I want this to be something like that. And I want this to be something like that. 
And now we unflatten this and we copy UVs and we go over here and we paste the UVs and it's gonna crash. No, it's not, yay. Yeah, I have PTSD from yesterday, guys. Like, it was crashing all the time. But I think it's something in my system that I have to check out. Um, so paste UVs here. Please don't crash. Okay. Yeah, this is way better. So, and now we have a cool bunch of stairs, which we can use with the UVs and decimate, keep UVs, and you have a game ready piece of stairs, basically. That's how I usually roll, right? When it comes to this. And then you just put some rocks on the side and stuff, and it hides that. So let's just store a morph target first. Hello, it's so slow all of a sudden. Okay, let me store a morph target just in case. And uh, apply, let's risk it. There we go. So we got some weird looking stairs. We could even do something here with the, uh, again, if we're using dynamic, let me delete lower. And now I wanna maybe deform this. Deform, bent curve, let's bend curves here. Oh, wait, what? Wow, this is suddenly so slow. Let me turn off this just for a second. Is a ray mesh on? No. Hmm. That's weird. Well, let me bend the curve here and change the axis to this. Change the resolution of all that. Let's do something a little more interesting. So a little shape that's a little more interesting. Like so, you know, we're gonna have something like that. And now we go in and accept that. Turn on the displacement mode and apply the display. Oh, and delete morph target, store it again, and now apply it because we changed the mesh, right? <clears throat> there we go. Now we have some cool looking stairs. I know it sounds like it was like a long process. It's not, it's just that for some reason my computer is on the frets here. And one of the cool things about this is we can change the shape. Like this doesn't really work. So we can go to BMG, which is morph brush and we can morph it back to the previous state, you know? So we can even go over to the side and make this a lot flatter on the side like so and there we go and now what I usually do when I start sculpting this is I create layers I'll create a layer here we can delete this morph target and now on this layer we're gonna use our Andy dandy both the flattened brush or flatten this needs some more subdivisions I didn't do the subdivisions first because uh, again we're gonna stylize this so let's just divide one more time maybe two and now we can store layers and now we can start stylizing the shit out of this gives you a fair base again this was a cube right and suddenly you get the stairs and this works with any displacement map so you can come over here with a I don't know like some other pattern or whatever like wooden planks or whatever and you get like instant wooden planks just with a height map so if you're doing like a game art project I would create your tiling textures first your trim sheets, everything first, and then you move on to sculpting the props because 
then you get all of those trim sheets and etc laid out and in zbrush you just project that as a displacement map and you get your models actually deformed this is fairly important nowadays with unreal engine 5 they ditched the um, dynamic tessellation um, what do you mean blender is way better or unreal engine it, like depends if you're going to learn to do environments for games you need to know unreal engine or unity doesn't matter like blender ditched their own game engine i think a few years ago so blender is akin to like maya or or moto or cinema 4d right it's the same uh, sort of software it's just different interface different features but the very basic features i would say like the modeling aspect of it it's the same i would say it's just it's a matter of preference but that said i wouldn't replace zbrush with because zbrush is a separate part of the pipeline right so we're gonna take away all these all this noise here and we can do some cracks slash curve here whoa jesus what the heck see like my my pen is sometimes gives me gives me some annoying weird little mistakes whoops Oh, we're almost done, guys. Well, I, we're not done, but the stream is almost over. I should have scheduled a four-hour stream, but I mean, we're fine. I'm gonna do this for a bunch more streams, and then we're gonna go through the, the entire process of what I usually do in ZBrush to bring stuff, information from the model into substance from ZBrush. Get like these stylized stairs right there. Well, stylized ish, because they're still not. We could do a run this with a polish though. And we could do polish by polygroups, polish by groups, but we need to make those groups first. And we would, if we had time, go through polygroup it to polygroup these things back. Polygroup it is a Plugin. It's not a plugin, is it? Yeah, it's a plugin. It's a Z plugin. But it's basically your way to polygroup stuff faster using little seeds, even if you're at a very high poly stage. Right, so the block out would be something like this, and then we might add, we need to add some things. I was thinking of something like in a corner, like a corner piece with some stone walls and stuff. Thank you, Ian. See you later, man. Thanks for stopping by. What is your thought in Unreal Engine? Do 3D, 2D motion graphics trying to get into 3D, but I don't think they're all. Well, Unreal Engine is not a modeling kit. It's not a modeling, it's not a DCC app. Unreal Engine is a games engine, right? Uh, so it's a different thing. It's, it's not even, like you don't ditch one and use the other, you use both, right? So if you're doing motion graphics and you're learning and all that, I mean, Cinema 4D is pretty powerful for that. And I know Cinema 4D is, key in the motion graphics industry it's widely used for motion graphics so i would advise just check out the the maxon channel there's like a bunch of different tutorials even from la la does a lot of tutorials on motion graphics and shaders and materials rendering that some really cool stuff that she does 
and there's also a bunch of content just related to motion graphics so you can go over the channel all right guys i know we haven't done a lot <laughs> this is my first stream so i'm a little nervous so i'm sorry if something came out uh kind of iffy i'm definitely gonna rework that rock shape and i'm gonna also need to add some more information to the block out as well and then once we get all of that set up and the composition working we're gonna do some weird texturing stuff you know even in zbrush and then bring that into substance so next week i'm gonna stream on my own channel this time so 3 p.m saturday be sure to show up again type in my channel here let me see which uh, which my twitch channel but there's there's the the um youtube channel as well so let me just type that in if you guys want to check it out next week i'll be doing some cool stuff with this we'll be carrying on this thing and i hope you guys enjoyed it uh i know it wasn't the strongest stream <laughs> but it is cool to just hang out with you guys and just let me know uh if you have any other questions that you might that might pop out and zbrush uh i'm gonna save this just in case <laughs> And uh, just be sure to pop me on my socials, reach out to me on Twitch, YouTube, or Instagram. That's my Instagram right there as well. So be sure to type me in if you send me a DM, if you have any question relating, relating to the industry or related to ZBrush, I'm happy to, to, to answer that. And yeah. See if I missed any questions here. Yeah, I don't know if the lizard um a matarat is that a matarazzo. Matarazzo. Is that Naruto? I think that's Naruto though. <laughs> yeah, don't don't be afraid to to ask questions and show people your work i mean that's the only way you get to do connections is to ask people questions right so you're welcome all right guys this was the first stream on this little environment that we're making and uh i hope you guys enjoyed it i hope you guys uh reach out to me and I hope you guys watch next week's stream which is going to be carrying on from this and yeah happy zbrushing guys see you later bye